Tonight, fatal flight. Takeoff turns into terror in Nepal as plane crashes takes the lives of 18 on board. The pilot remaining the only survivor with investigations underway. Typhoon trouble. Storm warning levels raised as the Philippines drowns under torrents of heavy downpours, with super typhoon Gaimi gaining strength. Harris hits the trail. The Democratic camp swings hard at Trump and the Republicans return fire as possible impeachment actions against Harris are mute. Artistic escape. Visitors flock to the Aya Universe in Dubai for a whimsical visual experience to beat the summer heat. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We have lots of key updates to report to you this evening from diplomacy to natural disasters. But we start off with updates on the fatal plane crash in Nepal. Some 18 people were killed after a plane crashed and caught fire while it was taking off from Nepal's capital of Kathmandu. The pilot, who is currently receiving treatment in hospital, is the only survivor of the fatal incident. The pilot, who was pulled from the wreckage, is the sole survivor of the fatal crash. The plane, carrying two crew members and 17 technicians, was going for regular maintenance to Nepal's new Pokhara airport, they said. In a statement, the Civil Aviation Authority of Nepal said that shortly after takeoff, the aircraft veered off to the right and crashed on the east side of the runway. It is still unclear why. Located in the heart of the Kathmandu Valley, the country's main airport is ringed by mountains, affecting wind directions and making takeoff and landing a challenge for pilots. Following the crash, Kathmandu Airport was closed but reopened within hours, officials said. Nepal has been criticized for its poor air safety record, with the deadliest incident occurring in 1992, when a Pakistan International Airlines Airbus crashed into a hillside while approaching Kathmandu, killing 167 people. China will gradually raise its statutory retirement age in the next five years to try to cope with its aging population and bulking pension system. Life expectancy in the country has now risen above the United States to 78 years from just 36 years at the time of Communist Revolution in 1949. But China's retirement age remains one of the lowest in the world at 60 for men, 55 for women in white-collar jobs and 50 for working-class women. The party's central committee said in a key policy document highlighting the reforms that in line with the principle of voluntary participation with appropriate flexibility, they will advance reform to gradually raise the statutory requirement age in a prudent and orderly manner. It did not specify how much the age of retirement would be raised and by when, but a China Pension Development Report released at the end of 2023 wrote that 65 years old may be the final result after adjustment. The plan has been on the cards for a few years as China's pension budget dwindles. The state-run Chinese Academy of Social Sciences said in 2019 that the country's main state pension fund will run out of money by 2035, and that was an estimate before the COVID-19 pandemic, which hit China's economy hard. At the same time, the country's huge population has fallen for a second consecutive year in 2023 as the birth rate continues to decline. Typhoon Gaimi brought heavy rain to the Philippine capital region and northern provinces, prompting authorities to halt work and other activities. Meanwhile, China's National Meteorological Center renewed a red alert for the storm, which has intensified to a super typhoon. Residents in some areas were forced from their homes by the flooding. Residents waded through waist-deep flood water in the capital of Manila, some sitting in a makeshift buoyant container to stay dry while others ferry them across inundated streets. The presidential office suspended classes at all academic levels and work in most government offices in the capital region, which is composed of 16 cities and home to at least 13 million people because of the tropical storm. The Philippines state weather agency said Yemi, with maximum sustained winds of 100 155 kilometers per hour and gustiness of up to 190 kph was heading towards Taiwan. It did not make landfall, but it is enhancing a southwest monsoon, resulting in heavy to intense rain in northern Philippines.
The security on the scene stays tight today as well. Three boats from the Paris Police River Brigade scored up and down the river ahead of the Olympic Games due to start Friday in a drill simulating various scenarios that could threaten the event. The police's job was to keep a watch of the scene as well as its bank and to disembark as soon as possible in the case of an emergency. In a matter of seconds, the police take up positions on the boat's lower deck. It's one of the scenarios being gamed out ahead of the Olympic opening ceremony one of multiple training drills as the day approaches. Their job is to surveil the Seine, but also its banks, and to disembark as quickly as possible. It's an unprecedented mobilisation of security forces. On Friday, 45,000 police will be on duty, and during the Games, 20,000 security personnel and up to 18,000 military. In the meantime, boats moored along the Seine are given the go-over with a fine-tooth comb by sniffer dogs and naval divers searching for explosives. This small flotation device tied to a police boat has an important purpose. It's a floating drone that has sounded three kilometres of the Seine over three days. Its sonar reader allows it to literally plumb the depths of the river and detect any suspicious objects. So far, no suspicious objects that might spoil the party come Friday. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is expected to try to bolster support for Israel's war against Hamas as he delivers an address to the U.S. Congress. His visit comes amid pressure at home to secure the release of hostages still held by Hamas in the Gaza Strip, as well as political uncertainty for Israel's top ally, the United States, ahead of the country's November presidential election. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday, a day before he's set to speak to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. But even abroad, he could not escape pressing challenges back home. Video and images released by his office showed him meeting with families of Israeli hostages believed held by Hamas in Gaza. He told family members that, quote, the conditions are ripening for a ceasefire that would bring some of the captives home. But senior Hamas official Sami Abu Zuhri told there was nothing new in Netanyahu's stance. He said, quote, Netanyahu is still stalling and he is sending delegations only to calm the anger of Israeli captives' families. That anger was on full display in the days before Netanyahu left for Washington. Hamas gunmen killed 1,200 people and took more than 200 captive in an October 7th rampage through Israeli communities, according to Israeli tallies. In a week-long truce in November, more than 100 hostages were freed in return for 240 Palestinian prisoners. Hamas and other militants are still holding 120 captives, around a third of whom have been declared dead by Israeli authorities. Israel's devastating retaliatory air and ground operation has so far killed more than 39,000 people in 10 months of fighting, according to Palestinian health officials. Netanyahu's visit comes amid a renewed push by Israeli forces in Khan Yunis. Israel called on civilians to again evacuate the city. Months of efforts mediated by Egypt and Qatar to reach a new ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas gained momentum in recent weeks under a proposal outlined by U.S. President Joe Biden in May. An Israeli negotiation team was due on Thursday to resume talks that would include hostages being released in return for Palestinian prisoners held in Israeli jails. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Tonight on the road to the White House, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has gone on the offensive against Donald Trump in the first rally of a White House campaign, portraying November's election as a choice between a former prosecutor and a convicted felon. Meanwhile, pressure against her mounts as a House Republican lawmaker is filing articles of impeachment against Harris over both her handling of the border and knowledge of President Biden's alleged cognitive decline. 
Speaking to a crowd of about 3,000 in the battleground state of Wisconsin, Harris likened her Republican opponent to fraudsters that she had prosecuted. And simultaneously, U.S. Representative Andy Ogles is accusing Harris of breaching public trust and of willfully refusing to uphold U.S. immigration laws in two impeachment articles. It comes as a growing number of Republican lawmakers question what Harris knew and when about Biden's mental state after even allies observed that it had worsened over the course of the 81-year-old's White House term. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden returned to Washington just two days after announcing the end of his re-election bid. Biden boarded Air Force One to Washington, where he will address America in his final address from the Oval Office. This was Biden's first public sighting after spending nearly a week recovering from COVID-19 at his home in Delaware. Over in the Republican camp, former President Donald Trump held a conference call with reporters from Mar-a-Lago in which he brought to focus Vice President Kamala Harris's record and claimed that she wants to open borders. Trump spent the past day reacting to his changed political fortunes. In a barrage of social media posts, the former president ripped into his likely new opponent, lamented that Republicans were forced to waste a great deal of time and money prior to the Democratic shakeup, called for accountability on assassination attempts on his life, and criticized Democratic tributes to Biden. Later, Trump held a call with reporters, the first of its kind this cycle, during which he tested new attack lines against Harris. Trump Trump said over the phone that as a result of her dangerously extreme immigration policies, the largest invasion in history is now taking place at the southern border and it's getting worse, not better. Trump's appearance in Charlotte will provide his first opportunity to contrast himself with Harris before voters in a battleground state. Four years ago, North Carolina produced Trump's narrowest margin of statewide victory and it was expected to be a top battleground again in 2024. But it was left off the list of states that Biden can campaign viewed as most winnable after a sobering post-debate assessment of the race. Over 24 hours after the deadliest landslide in Ethiopia's history claimed the lives of over 200 people, rescuers undergo a desperate search, using shovels and their bare hands to find survivors buried under the ground. Gathered at the site of the tragedy, crowds of locals could only look on in anguish as rescuers desperately tried to search for survivors. Digging with shovels or their bare hands, they were putting their own lives at risk. Earlier in the day, rescue efforts had taken a turn for the worse after locals who rushed to help were buried by a second landslide. Over 200 people were killed, making it the deadliest landslide in the country's history. The tragedy took place in a remote mountainous area in southern Ethiopia, a region regularly affected by heavy rains, flooding and landslides that often result in mass displacements and casualties. Ugandan security forces detained dozens of young people as they took part in a banned protest rally in downtown Kampala against official corruption and alleged human rights abuses by the country's rulers. A video posted on social media by NTV Uganda also showed a small group of young people being intercepted and detained by police while they were marching. A police spokesman was not immediately available to say how many people had been detained. Authorities had banned the planned protests, citing intelligence they said showed criminal-minded youths might hijack it in order to loot and vandalize. Opposition leaders and rights activists say embezzlement and misuse of government funds are widespread in Uganda. They have long accused President Yoweri Museveni of failing to prosecute corrupt senior officials who are politically loyal or related to him. Museveni has repeatedly denied condoning corruption. He says whenever there is sufficient evidence, culprits including lawmakers and even ministers are prosecuted. Israeli cybersecurity startup Wiz has ended talks with Google parent Alphabet on a reported $23 billion deal in which it would have become the US tech giant's largest ever acquisition. Google parent Alphabet had plans for its biggest ever acquisition, but it looks like the deal is off. Israeli cybersecurity firm Wiz appears to have cancelled a $23 billion takeover. 
That's according to an internal memo. Wiz chief Asaf Rappaport says in the note that the firm will focus on an initial public offering instead. He says it is tough to walk away from a humbling offer, but is confident the firm can hit revenue goals without it. Neither company has ever officially confirmed talks over a deal, and neither commented on the latest report. If confirmed, it would be a blow for Google, which has been investing heavily in its cloud computing infrastructure. It would also be the second failed acquisition for Alphabet in recent times. It reportedly walked away from a deal to buy online marketing software company HubSpot. The $23 billion cited for Wiz could have been almost double the value put on the firm in a fundraising round in May. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Escaping Dubai's extreme summer heat, visitors step into a reimagined world filled with vibrant and interactive experience that combine art with technology and redefining traditional entertainment parks. From mirror rooms, light shows to illuminated gardens, Aya Universe, a 40,000 square foot park, transports visitors to another dimension through 12 immersive rooms filled with futuristic art installments. Launched in December of 2022, Aya has since exceeded 750,000 visitors, making it one of the most visited attractions in Dubai. Visitors praise the installations, stating it evokes serenity, even if they're experiencing hot weather, and that as soon as you enter and tour around, you tend to forget most of your worries. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Amrata Vikramasinghe will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.